welcome to Inside Out, as uh, Dan said. This is the first of our spring series. And uh, in the weeks ahead, we're going to be hearing from a number of folks who are each in their own way at the forefront of science journalism. And they each in their own way are, are coming at this confluence of technology, changing media platforms, and creativity to grow, that go into truly great science writing. If, if, if you don't mind, Dan, I'll, I'll run through the calendar because I actually wrote the dates oh. down. So, because um, I never, I don't trust my memory. Um, so on March 10th, on March 10th, we'll talk with uh, author and blogger and, if I may say, media pixie um, Jennifer Ouellette, who will fly out from Los Angeles to join us on March 22nd. Uh, I mean, on March 10th, on March 22nd, we'll. Okay. <laughs> On March 22nd? Ah. Uh, we'll sit down with uh, Joe Palka from, from National Public Radio. And on April 5th, uh, we'll do something very special and we'll conclude the spring series with a special session on medical writing and the big book with a, uh, an extended conversation with science writing surgeon Siddhartha Mukherjee, who is the author of what uh, is this uh, season's uh, uh, most well-regarded book uh, coming out of the medical and science arena uh, called uh, The Emperor of All Maladies, uh, a biography of cancer. And it's a finalist for a National Book Award, and it's in the running for a Pulitzer. And it's, uh, it'd be very interesting to hear uh, the challenges and uh, tricks of a science writer who's working from the technical side trying to get at the uh, general public. But tonight, um, we're going to talk about apps. We're going to talk about how um, these small and, and uh, increasingly ubiquitous programs are transforming the ways that our work can reach the reading public and how eventually they may offer us as science writers an opportunity to regain control um, of our professional destinies. Our guest uh, is Mike Haney. Uh, Mike is co-designer of uh, groundbreaking iPad, iPhone, and Droid apps uh, for popular science. Um, he's one of the information architects um, who is designing this new wave of publishing possibilities. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a very uh, key moment in the, in the publishing business uh, around the iPad. Traditional media conglomerates like News Corp, for, for which I work, uh, are in a kind of uh, controlled panic. I mean, they're pouring millions into iPod publications without a real clear idea of where this is going to go. Um, and at the same time, uh, individual media entrepreneurs are, are really rubbing their hands at the opportunities that this uh, presents. As this is an example, uh, uh, imaginative journalists are already using these platforms to become their own publishers. And I think this is something that we ought to take to heart. Uh, earlier this month, Nicholas Thompson and his colleagues, uh, uh, Nicholas Thompson at the New Yorker, launched an app called The Atavist uh, for iPads and iPhones, which is a, a device to launch and publish individual long-form narratives, um, one at a time, kind of like old-fashioned LP records. Um, and uh, their first uh, trial of this uh, uh, actually went to number 44 on Amazon. Uh, it did better than Amy Chua. Uh, and actually was two spots ahead of George W. Bush. This is interesting. This is interesting. So Mike, um, here now, is the U.S. Director of Moving Media Plus, which is the company that sells and develops the Mag Plus digital tablet publishing platform, which uh, Bonnier, uh, which now owns Popular Science, uh, developed uh, last year. And uh, Mike was one of the original creators of this platform in his previous role as Deputy Director of R&D for Bonnier. Now, a lot of you may already know Mike as an editor uh, for a long time at Popular Science and most recently as Executive Editor of Popular Science. And uh, he's still on the masthead there as Digital Development Director. And he's also a contributing editor at Condé Nast Traveler. Now, just I want to mention this to, to just you know, footnote the value of uh, graduate uh, journalism education. Uh, Mike is, a, is also a graduate of the Medill School of Journalism, that other place in the heartland. Um, now, it's a truism that digital technology has upended traditional publishing. I mean, it's disintegrated traditional publishing models, and it's fostered the 24-hour news cycle that sets the pace for most of us. Uh, we file the instant embargoes lift, we blog, we tweet, 
we do spot video, we document events with our cell phone cameras. And in the process, you know, we've become much more nimble as news gatherers. We connect with many, many more readers. Uh, but we've also become minions of the moment. We are, uh, in I think uh, David Pogue's uh, phrase, digital serfs, uh, the free labor of aggregators, uh, the indentured servants of content farms. Um, but the technology that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, first and foremost, may offer uh, big publishers a way to move traditional subscription models into this new uh, technology. It may make uh, Apple and Google um, the, uh, the news cores of the next century. I mean, it's hard to know. They'll grab a big check of the profits. But it may, because uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the nature of the app, it, it may offer us as science writers uh, an opportunity to profit more directly from our work. Now, that's the hope. This is, this week is a particularly uh, uh, great moment to be having this conversation. As some of you may know, um, there's been a kind of long jab um, in the publishing world around the iPad uh, since it was introduced because it was unclear as to whether Apple would allow in its lovely walled garden um, publishers to actually engage in their traditional subscriber subscription uh, business transactions. And well, just this week, uh, Apple announced its new um, subscription plan for iPad, iPad publishing. Um, and I will say that Popular Science was, I think, the very first publication to kind of sign on. And within 24 hours, Google uh, instantly matched um, Apple by at least announcing that on its Android platforms it was going to have some similar arrangement. What we're going to do now, I'm going to ask Mike to take a few minutes and uh, give us an overview of this uh, emerging technological landscape. Tell us a little bit about what's possible and whatever. And uh, then I think we'll talk a little bit about how this gives us an opportunity to reimagine what a magazine might be, um, the kinds of things that Popular Science is doing with its app. And I want to remind you all that uh, this is a conversation, not a lecture. Uh, I want to encourage you all to sort of chime in, to interrupt. Uh, we are taping, so it would be handy if when you have your question, uh, get Dan's attention and make sure he gets a microphone to you. Uh, but don't let us drone on too long interrupted, uninterrupted. Um, so Mike, if uh, you've been patient, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, now uh, walking us through them. Sure, uh, actually I'll, I'll deep you wanna, this. You wanna slide over here to the? Yeah, I think I'll okay. this. Um, all right, hello. Uh, let me see if we, that's, oh, there we go. Uh, okay, uh, so what you're seeing back here behind this very haughty title that I came up with, um, uh, Beyond the Pages, Storytelling in the Tablet Age. Uh, mm. This is actually a concept video that we put together uh, now probably a year and a half ago. So at PopSci, and as, as Lee said, my background's an editor. I'm not a tech guy, I'm not a software developer, I'm not a business guy, I was an editor. Um, graphic designer in a former life. I went to Medill and became a magazine guy and I was at PopSci for years. Um, and, and the reason I'm up here now, how I ended up in this space, is that PopSci had uh, both an editor and a publisher who were just, and a parent company, who were particularly interested in what's coming next and what does it mean for us. Um, that may be because the parent company is based in Stockholm and they're slightly more progressive thinking maybe than some of us are here. Um, and when they started saying we want to play with and start experimenting and think about what comes next and what does this mean and what was a magazine going to look like when it's on a tablet and not on paper, I raised my hand and said, I'd kind of like to talk about that. It sounds interesting. Um, and, and just sort of got myself in that process to the point where they had to just pay me to do this because I wasn't doing my other job much anymore. Uh, so what, what you're seeing up here uh, is a concept video that came out of um, about four or five months of kind of conceptual testing and thinking and research and talking to readers um, and trying to figure out this question of, well, what is a magazine when it goes on a tablet? What things about magazines or reading in general, particularly magazines, do people like and should we try to keep? And what things don't really make any sense and should we not try to keep? Like, like an animation of a page turning does the world really need that on a screen? Do we need to make people think they're turning a page? We think probably not. 
Um, do we really need pages at all? Should things actually be constrained by the edges of the screen device, or is it really just a big infinite canvas? Um, what should a table of contents look like? How should you get around? Should it be like a magazine where you kind of tend to flip like this and then the magazine makers get to decide, well, I want you to read the front of book first and then the feature stories and then the product stuff always comes in the back and then the weird classified ads for sex pills. It, should that same order still be there or should we let people jump around wherever they want? Um, should people be able to, what this is, save things, should be able to clip something out of a digital thing and save it on a scrapbook and put it somewhere else? Should you be able to just grab an article and share it off to a friend over Facebook or Twitter or whatever? Um, so this was, anyway, this was a video we came up with with a, um, uh, a design firm in, in London called Berg and it was fairly close, much cooler, but fairly close to what we actually ended up building, um, which I'll show in a bit. So uh, that's a little bit of an intro and then I'll jump into um, just kind of the, I'll try to do this quickly. How did we get to where we are now, the iPad and all of this stuff? Um, and I think it's kind of instructive, especially when you start thinking about it from a sort of, you know, as Lee said, all the millions that are being poured into this now and why that's happening. Um, I would say particularly in the magazine industry, and I'll talk more about that because I know it a lot better than I know the news industry or the newspaper industry. Um, it's happening mostly because of, of the, uh, frowny faces that you see up here um, at the end of these other bullet points and because of the web. Because when the web happened, the big magazine companies pretended it didn't happen for about 10 or 15 years um, and let uh, other people come along and figure it out. So popular science, which has always been a leader in uh, it's, you know, one of its core things is covering new technology and new gadgets and new devices and things that are coming out. But now if you want to go to the web and you want to see what's the latest technology, you don't go to PopSci, you go to Gizmodo. It's kind of stupid, right? Like PopSci should have been the Gizmodo, but they weren't because the media companies were just going, I don't really know about that, I know about the print, and this is kind of, this is the business I know and what I know how to do. Um, and then we started thinking about, you know, um, what we did start thinking about was, well, we know print, we know how to put issues together, uh, and I guess we should probably put them up on screen so that everybody who has a screen can get them that way, and won't that be great because then we don't have to pay to mail them out. Um, and so what we started with was, well, we'll just make PDFs of all the pages that we've already designed and we'll just, we'll put them out on, uh, on, these, on the computer screens. And that's what the, the sort of the top ones are there, PDF replicas, and these are still out there today. The two big companies that do it are Zinio and Texterity. Um, and it's never really worked as a business. It turns out people don't like reading magazines this way. It's just not that <coughs> enjoyable to load up a, a, a PDF on your desktop and have to pinch in and, or not even pinch on your desktop, but sort of click the zoom button and scroll around and see. It just, it's not the same thing of what you do with a magazine. You get it in the mail and you sit down on the couch and you flip through it and you look forward to what's coming. So then we got a little bit more creative and we tried to, some other companies like Seros is one, uh, tried to add more kind of widgets and bang to the thing. So it was still an issue. You'd still kind of flip through it, but now there were buttons you could press that would bring up new stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe a movie you could play in the middle of it because, well, it's the internet and people like movies on the internet, right? Uh, that didn't work really either. Um, and, and this is really where I got into it. This is probably three years ago at PopSci. We thought, well, let's try this. Let's, instead of just making a PDF and put it up there, what if we make something that's totally built from scratch for this medium, for these on-screen, uh, interactive sorts of, of magazines, not a website, but still kind of a space that has pages, um, that's a curated collection of stuff. And we built these, these issues called Genius Guides, and we built three of them uh, around uh, greening your home and setting up a home theater. And as an editor, it was a real kick because all of a sudden I wasn't constrained by, I wasn't having arguments with the art department about, well, I can only fit 300 words on this page because I need this picture to be at least a, a quarter of the page, you know, big. And so, well, you're going to have to cut that. It's digital. I got all the room in the world now. And, and particularly when I can take content and I can put it behind buttons. So I could say, you know, if you want to learn about this, click here and a thousand words appears. And if you want to learn about this, click here and a thousand words appear. But I can group it all together in one page. It was really interesting to have this third dimension to start to edit for and create content for and think about, right, how do you put a package of stuff together? Before I would have thought in an article and I'd go, okay, if this is a front of book article, it's a 300 words I have to explain this concept or to talk about these three products because I need to get the images on. Uh, now the whole sort of world is my oyster and I can get as deep as I want. So we put these things together with all this content in them uh, and uh, nobody bought them. Uh, the people, then we tried giving them away, nobody downloaded them. 
The people that did download them, we said, well, what did you think of it, and, and what did you like? And people said, there's not enough content in this thing. Uh, and as an editor, it was maddening, because I said, yes, there is. I carefully edited like 10,000 words in this thing. It's there. Trust me. It's just, you got to click the button to find it. Turns out people don't click buttons. They expect that in a magazine, when you turn a page, what you see is what's there. Um, all of this was uh, very disheartening because we worked very, very hard on these, but it was also incredibly instructive when we got to that period I talked about in the beginning of going, all right, now we're on a tablet. Well, it's different because you're touching and you're not clicking your mouse around. You're not sitting in front of your computer. You're kind of leaning into your tablet. Um, but one of the things that really influenced the way we ended up designing the platform that we publish on, and it's a little bit different from some of the other ones that are out there, is we don't hide a lot of content behind buttons because I still don't think people will hit them. And as an editor, I'm afraid nobody's going to find my story uh, that I carefully edited. So we instead try to make it really easy and natural to sort of find that content. And the next sort of step after these slightly more interactive PDFs that nobody bought and nobody wanted uh, were iPhone magazines, because the iPhone came up for the iPad. And of course, magazines went, well, we should probably figure out what's there. Um, and there's a number of them out there today. There's a number of different platforms that they can use that, that uh, companies are using to publish on them. Um, they also largely don't work. Um, they don't work for, for a different set of reasons. They don't work mostly because one of the things we learned in trying to figure out what a magazine experience is is that magazines, are, certainly as opposed to newspapers and certainly as opposed to the web, are, are very much defined by their design, by the fact that their big kind of luscious pages are oftentimes spreads. And it's, it's that layout, that sort of very careful layout that the editors and the designers argue about every day of how big the headline is and where the sidebar goes and how big this image should be and how do we lead a reader through this story. Uh, that's a whole lot of what makes a magazine a magazine, and people like it, and it's really hard to do on a three or four inch screen. You simply can't create that kind of an immersive space where people sort of lose themselves and, and really kind of get into your little world you've made for them. Now, that's not to say there's not room for magazines to do stuff on the iPhone. A lot of magazines uh, have done really cool apps that make sense. Lucky has a brilliant shopping app, as well they should. Um, you know, at PopSci, we tried to do a buyer's guide app because we thought that made sense. It didn't do very well. Um, it was pretty ugly, and that's mostly my fault. Um, but actually producing magazines on this, um, pretty tricky to do. Now, we actually are in the, my little software world now playing with, okay, if we don't want to just take the pages of a magazine and put them on the iPhone, we still have this issue. I mean, if you're a publisher of a magazine or even an editor, who people, somebody who wants to reach people with your content, there's a billion phones out there. I mean, there's like 15 million iPads, but there's like a billion phones, and you don't want to just cut them off and say, well, we're not going to publish to those. So I think there's still a lot of work and a lot of creativity uh, and a lot of room to figure out an interesting way to do some of the things we do in magazines, curated packages, uh, even long-form stories on the iPhone. I just think nobody's quite cracked it yet. And then we got tablets. And then the world changed on January 29th, 2010, when Steve came out and said, here's the iPad and it's coming. Um, and we, at the company, um, because we'd been doing all this work for four or five months at this point, and we'd gotten to the point of this video, and we knew what we wanted to build, we started building. Um, and we were there April 4th when it launched. Um, and what we now have, oh, these are just some of the examples of, ah, let me go back to this one. Sorry, I forget I got tricky with my, this is an example out of that genius guide I was talking about. So this is a spread of what we built there um, from the greening your home guide. You know, really big type so you can read it right away even if you're sitting back a little bit from your screen big buttons that say key statistics revealed and uh, read your meter and find the biggest users, all of which now seem much more obscure than they did at and, the time. And nobody pushed these buttons. Nobody pushed them. Uh, we put the big arrow on there. Uh, you know, again, I, like I said, I'm looking at this now and I'm thinking this language is not nearly as clear as I thought it was when I was designing <laughs> these things, but still it looks, there's a button that says go. Like, why wouldn't you click a button that says go? What was funny is what people clicked, uh, just as a little aside, is up in the very right-hand corner, there's a thing that says next, which was just telling you what the next story is. We do this all the time in magazines, the page furniture, we call it, the stuff around the edges. Um, that's what people clicked, and that didn't work, because in this platform we use, which is Zinnia's platform, you can't turn the page that way. You had to, like, grab at the edge of the corner of it and then, like, turn the page over with your mouse. Uh, so, yeah, that was a little maddening. Um, this is a page out of, or a screen out of GQ's um, 
iPhone app. And what they do is they separate out the images from the text. So I get the images up there. And then if I want to read the story, I have to click the read story button. And then it takes me out of, then I don't get to see the images along with the story that I'm reading. So then I have to click another button to go back to the image. And it's a total nightmare to read. Um, the only good thing it's, the only thing it's actually good for is if you want to read one of GQ's 5,000 word stories on your phone. It's actually really easy to do that where you don't need the images. Um, and then this is just a, a page out of um, one of our new tablet magazines. So this is what we've ended up with in the tablet world. Uh, like I said, it was really interesting because when we started this project in, in 09, um, summer, fall 09, everybody was talking about tablets. Everybody had one on the market or was about to have one on the market. Apple was doing something. And so we kind of started designing the system thinking that this was the world we were designing for, that, that what was going to happen was that, it, you know, by spring there would be five different tablets on different operating systems and people would be buying all sorts of different ones, there would be different screen sizes. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, what happened was Steve came out with a really good tablet, which apparently scared the hell out of everybody else, and they all retreated and went back and said, okay, I guess we better rethink because what we had sucked in comparison to what he just came out with. Uh, which means that Apple's dominated the market for the last, uh, well, eight, nine months now. Um, and there's 15 million iPads out there, and there's basically no other tablets out there. I mean, there are some, but nobody's buying them at all. That's about to change. Um, Android, Google's backed uh, operating system, is launching a new version, which is optimized for tablets. In the past, it's really only been good at phones. Um, and Motorola, among others, is coming out with a new tablet which is very sleek and uses this new operating system and um, may very well present the first actual competition to the iPad, but the iPad's still 15 million ahead, which is a pretty good head start. Um, and the iPad will most likely uh, come out with a new version itself this uh, spring, which will push everybody sort of back again. Um, but just quickly, sort of, you know, this, this space that we do have now, as it is starting to diversify a little bit, you got the iPad, you've got Android, um, Samsung, Motorola, the two big ones coming out, Blackberry's making a tablet. Um, that's kind of their last gasp into relevance um, as their business population dies out. Um, HP uh, bought Palm, and Palm, just before it died, had built what was actually a kind of beautiful and great and easy to use operating system for phones. So HP bought them and is using that operating system now in a new tablet that they just announced. Um, in fact, they just announced it, and I don't even have the right image of it in here last week. Um, and Time Magazine announced that their, or Time Inc. announced that their publications would be on uh, this HP tablet when it comes out this summer. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing is not quite a tablet, but sort of tablet related is Google's Chrome App Store. Uh, Google, in addition to de developing the Android thing and the tablets and all this, has another project going where they have this operating system they call Chrome. They have a, a web browser called Chrome. Uh, and so they're building this sort of web-based operating system called Chrome with little web apps. And you say, well, what's the difference between a web app and a website? It's a very good question. Uh, and they're not even particularly good at answering that. Uh, right now they say, well, you know, an app will do things like remember your, a uh, weather app will remember your zip code when you go back to it, so you don't have to type it in again, and, and it'll keep some data offline, so even if you're not connected, it'll, it'll still kind of work for you. Um, it's all a little nascent right now, and they're not sort of doing much and saying much. They launched this Chrome App Store, which is a little picture up there in the corner. There's some apps out there. We're, we're building one for PopSide just to kind of try it out and see what's it like to revisit this question of can we make magazines enjoyable to read on a screen? Because um, there's an awful lot of these screens out there too. Um, but depending on who you talk to, Chrome may actually be the future. Because the problem we have right now is this problem of there's an iOS, there's an Android OS, there's a Blackberry OS, there's a web OS, um, and then there's actually a few more which I didn't even bother putting up here because they're so small they don't matter. And if you're a publisher and you've got to figure out where you're going to put your money, or if you're just a person who wants to build an app and publish something cool out to the world, you've got to figure out where to go. What might end up being sort of the unifying world is, is HTML5, which I'm mm -hmm. told now you're just supposed to call HTML because it's the next standard of HTML. Um, and that's what the Chrome App Store is. It's just HTML-based apps. Um, and that, people I talk to in the industry sort of all think that this world of which we got five different operating systems and different tablets is probably going to come to an end because it just really isn't sustainable. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Either Apple owns the whole world, which might happen like they did with, with MP3 players where if you have an MP3 player, it's probably an iPod. 
Um, that might be the world we live in. Or if it turns out people do want to buy devices that weren't made by Apple, uh, we'll probably end up in an HTML world where everybody just builds stuff in HTML and then you can kind of consume it anywhere, on a website or on this tablet or on your phone. And hopefully if they do it well, it'll kind of look nice on any given screen. That's sort of all of our hope. Um, and then the other sort of tension here is just around the, the screen sizes. I have seven inch versus 10 inch. This is another thing in this world of trying to figure out what tablets are going to come out there, what people are going to buy, what do they want to use, um, is what size. Uh, the people, you know, iPad's a 10-inch device, the new Motorola's a 10-inch device. Samsung came out with a 7-inch device and said, well, you know, the problem with the iPad is it's not portable. I mean, I can't carry that thing around. It's way too heavy. And Apple goes, well, we didn't intend people to carry it around. It's a couch device. You sit on your couch and you put it on your lap and you Facebook with it. It's not a, I got a portable device. It's called my phone. Um, I tend to sort of be in that camp. I don't really get the seven inch argument, but we'll see. And it's a really interesting question from a publishing perspective. We did a, an issue on the seven inch device just to see, well, I know how to design for this canvas, the iPad canvas now. We've kind of figured that out and it's nice. It's pretty big. It's kind of digest size, but it's pretty big. You can do big images. Once you get a little bit smaller to seven inch, it becomes kind of a whole nother world when I'm trying to fit an image on screen with text and how much text can I actually see there and is the text readable. Um, what size we end up with is going to be uh, is going to be an interesting question for us. And the other problem is what shape is it? Uh, if you're trying to design something for the iPad and for one of these other devices, iPad's pretty square. A lot of these other devices are really long. They're kind of that widescreen format. If I'm trying to lay out a page and again do what magazines do well, create these beautiful intentional layouts, uh, it gets tough when I'm designing. I mean, can you imagine making a magazine for five different paper sizes? Like it would just be crazy. And that's essentially the world we live in now. So this is kind of my cheat sheet for, of all the chaos I just talked about, what I think, this is the Mike Haney's guide to what actually matters. Um, nine inch and above, I, I, seven inch tablets are stupid. Nobody's gonna buy them. Um, nobody has so far. Uh, iOS, the, I mean, like I said, Apple's ahead. Uh, Android is a competitor, because Google's got more money than God, and they're gonna keep putting money into this until they take a little dent out of Apple. And maybe BlackBerry, because it turns out the device doesn't suck, and there are a lot of people in the world, particularly IT managers at companies who control how the company spends their IT budget, who like BlackBerry. Um, so they might actually get a little foot back into the world with this. Um, but really, it's, a, it's an Apple-Google battle. That's, that's who's going to control this, uh, this world. Um, and then, as I said, the Chrome and, and the HTML. And the reason it says sigh after HTML5 is that Sports Illustrated, which you can't really see there, has an app out on... Um, on the Chrome Web Store, which is essentially a slideshow of cool sports images, but it's worth checking out, um, and it's free. The other part where this gets weird, and I'll, I'll run through as quick so we can talk about more interesting things, is, all right, so you got a tablet, and let's just talk about the iPad, and you've decided you want to publish something, you're a magazine publisher, and you want to come out on the iPad. Um, now you've only got about another 25 choices to, to deal with, and that is uh, how do you do it? What is the mechanism by which you take your content as it exists in print and get it on the iPad? Um, and so there's, I, I break it down into these sort of rough categories, and I'll start with the middle is the PDF replica, the same things we talked about on, the, on this screen, just make a PDF of the page and dump it on here. And while it's a little bit small, but people can pinch in and zoom and move around and read it. Kind of a pain in the butt to use, but really easy to do. It doesn't cost you anything, really. You just kind of, you know, your production person sends off files to Zinio. They take care of it. And you don't really have to think about it anymore. Um, and there's a few like that. Zinio does it. There's another company called Pixel Mags that has a bunch out there. Condé Nast had developed, which is the GQ one down in the corner, their own system uh, for doing this. Not quite PDF-based, but pretty close, which they're actually abandoning now. Um, they had a little internal war, and, and the people who did that lost. Um, and another company called Bite Size Candy, which actually doesn't do that anymore. I just learned they're using Adobe system now. The other, the, the top is the custom tablet creations. And this is the systems kind of like the one we built, where it's a platform. And by platform, I mean it's both tools on the kind of creation. All of these are really InDesign based, because that's what we all use to lay out magazines. So InDesign plus a little kind of some sort of tool to add interactivity, like movies and 360s and, and slideshows and stuff like that. Um, and then some way to spit it out to an app and read it. And there's really, really three players in that space. Uh, Meg Plus, which is the one I do, um, Bonnier has, and there's about 15 publications out on that now. Um, Such as? Uh, popular Science, Popular Photography, Transworld Snowboarding. Um, we just launched a couple of cookbooks from William Sonoma, um, which are actually really awesome and beautiful, and one is Crock-Pot Cooking, and it's full of delicious recipes. Um, 
And then uh, we've got, what else do we have in the US? Uh, Science Illustrated, which is a science magazine we publish. And then we've got about six or seven uh, international publications because Bonnier has a big footprint over in Scandinavia. So we have um, a bunch of Scandinavian publications and, as well. And they're all working off the same? They're all working on the same platform, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they all have their, each their own apps. You know, if you went out to the, to the store, you'd search for Popular Photography Plus, because mm -hmm. um, the plus tells you it's special. Um, and, uh, but the, the, it works the same way. The way that you present the content is the same, the buttons, the kind of navigation is the same. Um, the other two big players in the space is Adobe. Um, Monster Behemoth uh, mm -hmm. owns the creative world. Everybody who publishes anything uses Adobe tools to do it. Um, Adobe has, uh, they have quite a few uh, clients out there. Their most uh, visible ones are the Condé Nast pubs. Wired launched with Adobe. Mm -hmm. um, New Yorker's out on it now, a couple other. And Condé has announced that all of their titles will be coming on to the, plat onto the, the iPad on the Adobe platform. Um, some slight differences, which I'll show you when we jump on the pad, between how they do it and how we do it. Um, and then the other is Woodwing. And Woodwing is a company, if you've never heard of them, they make um, like these, they, they make sort of the trafficking systems or the software that magazines use or a lot of magazines use to kind of move articles from one editor to another or to sort of uh, move things through your workflow. Um, they came out and, and it's smart because they've got, a, like Adobe, they're already kind of in all of these, you know, everybody who's, who's making magazines knows these companies and a lot of them already have them in house. So they came in and said, we, we made a little add on you can put on here that'll let you take what you're already doing and, and put it on the iPad. The weird thing is that uh, both of those systems are actually a fair amount of work. Uh, it should be kind of easy because they're already there, but they're both pretty labor intensive. And Adobe made a really interesting choice when they started building this with Wired. They started building it in Flash. Um, and then Steve came out and said, no, nah, can't do Flash. Uh, we're not going to allow it on the iPad. So Adobe had to scrap what they were doing and start over. And that kind of put them off, which is why Wired wasn't there at launch. And then just before they came out, uh, Apple said, well, some Flash is OK. It's just really just a mess with Adobe because you're <clears throat> Steve and you can do such things. Um, but that, that little hiccup, that little fact that they kind of had to start over and that they very much tied a partnership with Wired and with Condé um, slowed them down a fair amount and, and sort of left open room for people like my company or for Woodwing um, and for all of these other little ones I'm going to talk about to come in and potentially be in this market, which is kind of stupid. If you're Adobe, like you should own this market because we already this is what you do. You do publishing. We already have all your tools. Like, I'll pay you a little extra and just get my thing out there. Um, that's not the world we live in. It might be the world we soon live in, in which case I'll be looking for a new job or going back to school. Um, then the interesting category down here at the bottom, um, others. And, and there's more that could come, and I'll pop out and show you a couple others. There's the Atavist, which Lee mentioned, um, which I'll show you on the iPad. Uh, there's a company called Wonder Factory, which is a little design firm here in New York that built um, if Woodwing is sort of the back-end technology, Wonder Factory did that kind of front-end, the conceptual development work stuff I was talking about for Time and for um, a number of others. They've partnered with this company, Texterity, which is one of the ones I mentioned at the beginning, who does the PDF replica things, um, to come out with a apparently fairly cheap and apparently fairly easy way of publishing. And not just doing PDFs, but things that look like they're created for the iPad, sort of custom creations. They haven't launched it yet, but they're about to. Um, that's going to be kind of interesting. Uh, the Atavis, as Lee mentioned, is a, is a tool set to both an app uh, and sort of storefront, and then also a tool set to publish um, books and other sort of long form uh, journalism um, in ways that are nice and easy to read, but also have a lot of this interactivity. Um, and then, actually, I'll just jump out of here. Um, and show you in the browser. Uh, Yahoo announced a thing uh, just last week called LiveStand, um, which is their way of translating publications to the tablets. It's uh, HTML based. There's no sort of production to it at all. You just kind of send them your files and then they just sort of translate them into this sort of templated system. Um, and then they'll have sort of a newsstand where you can go and buy, you know, any of the publications that are on it. Um, and then there's another company that I just heard about called OnSwipe um, that's doing something similar to that. It's an HTML-based thing, um, apparently very easy to build uh, for. I don't know if everything has to be sketched in blue, hmm. but... Um, <laughs> But they've just started kind of coming out and talking, and I'm really curious to see what they're going to end up looking like, because they've also talked about being very, very cheap. 
So, and, and when I say cheap, and this is sort of interesting to know, like what does all this cost, right, if yeah. you're a publisher? If you're using Adobe system uh, to get live, you're probably talking about 15, 20 grand, and then you're probably gonna pay them a uh, thousand, couple thousand dollars a month, plus a cut of every issue that you sell. Uh, Woodwing is a little trickier because with Woodwing you have to have their whole sort of production system in place before you, which is a really expensive like tens of thousands of dollars hard implementation before you can use spit out apps on it. So they're really expensive. We're trying to be cheaper because we're trying to just get more people on the device. So for us it's like 5,000 to get an app and then like depending on what you want to do, if you want to publish every month, it's 500 bucks a month or 600 bucks a month. These are going to come out and be $99. I'm making that up because I don't know what these guys are, but they're going to be like 99 bucks and no monthly fee. Uh, or they're going to be free. Or we're going to get a world, Google's talking privately about building a newsstand and maybe not just building a newsstand, but maybe building a tool set for people to publish to the newsstand. And it'd be something kind of like what happened with Blogger years ago. Like, there was a time when it was, when you would literally go pay a, a web design firm $10,000 to build you a blog. And then some people built a platform that was really easy and really easy to replicate called Blogger and Google bought it and said, here world, have Blogger. Everybody make one, it's free. That may very well be the world that we uh, end up having here, in which case again, I'm gonna be looking for a new job. Um, but I actually think that would be awesome. I mean, I sort of hope that happens and I hope, I hope we and the company I work for and whoever I end up working for find ways to still do something of value that people wanna pay for, but uh, I think this is awesome. Um, well, so linger on it for a minute then and just tell us a little bit more about what a $99 or free um, system like this would, would do. I mean, what... Well, so what's sort of interesting what's, about... What's the idea here? I mean, yeah, I mean, what's interesting about tablet publishing... So, look, you, you, could, you can go out and build a blog now, right? You can go out and, and put up a website and you can access that website from the tablet. So you can... You know, there's nothing stopping you now. We, we're, we're past the sort of revolution point of like, hey, you as an individual can publish to the world. Like, we all live in that world now. What's interesting about tablet publishing and what the, the media companies are trying to do, what our system is trying to do, and interestingly, what, what these companies, you know, from, from uh, Yahoo to, to these guys um, to Flipboard are trying to do is say, well, maybe just going to a website isn't sort of the best experience. Maybe it is kind of like what we know people like about magazines, that sort of immersive, curated, issue-based, heavily visual, uh, designed, very intentionally laid out uh, kind of world, maybe there's value in that. Maybe it turns out people actually do like that experience. It's why magazines persist and actually do fairly well as compared to a lot of the newspaper business. Magazines aren't hurting that bad. They have an advertising problem. They don't really have a consumer problem. Um, tablets, because of the big beautiful screen, um, which is only going to get more beautiful as the screens get higher and higher resolution, and because of sort of the size of them, which is why I think the 10 inch is cooler than the smaller mm -hmm. screen, can give you kind of that same experience. It's just enough space to, to design something, to go, okay, I want a headline that's this big and I want an image here and I want a little bit of text and to do a layout. Um, and, and it's big enough that as a reader, I can get immersed in it. You know, I can, I can lose myself in that design and in that visual. And then I can deliver because of the app world, um, because it's not just a website where I'm gonna go to this website and there's gonna be a banner up here that's blinking at me and then my little email icon is gonna be clicking up in the corner. Uh, this is a world in which I can contain everything in an app and that curation can be not only part of the issue, so I can still send out issues, this little package of pages and, and news that uh, I think is important this week or this month, but I can give you a branded app so you can go get the Popular Science app and know that anything that spits through that app has been curated by the editors of Popular Science, sort of has that imprint on it. Now you could argue popsci.com is the same thing, but the web's messy, right? There's comments and blogs tend to be a little bit looser. Um, what's the other interesting thing about this, um, and I don't have any slides to show this, the other place I think publications and, and magazines get interesting in this space is, so right now I've got the web, and the web's really great for really frequent updating, and it's good for doing things that we expect digital stuff to do, like sharing or like saving. You know, I can click an, an Instapaper button on a website, I, can, I know then it's out in the cloud somewhere. When I'm on the ride in the subway on the way home, I can read that article on my phone. I ought to be able to do that because it's digital, right? It's all cloud, it's all bits. Uh, I can easily share things with people on Facebook or Twitter or email or whatever. Uh, 
when I'm reading magazines, I kind of want to do that. You know, you read a magazine, you go, oh, so-and-so would like this story, or oh, I want to remember to buy this thing later. It's a pain, right? It's a hassle to do in paper. You rip a page out or you dog ear a corner. More likely, you just never do it. You know, I got to remember to go to that website later, and you put it down and you never go to the website. This is the first time we can both present that magazine experience, nice issue curated, walled off, walled off in a good way sort of world, but also give you those hooks out there because this is digital and it can be connected. So one of the things we're playing with on the platform, I mean, the next sort of big upgrade for us is what we call MyMag Plus, and it's going to be MyMag Plus. Okay. Um, I don't know if we'll sort of brand it that way publicly, but that's the way we're talking about it. And it's adding that tool set, that connectivity, that sort of world onto your magazine. So I'm still reading my page, and it's a beautiful design, and I'm just I'm reading it and I'm enjoying it. But if I make a motion of some kind, I don't know, you long press the screen or you double tap it or you twist it, I don't know, do something, then you enter into connected mode. Then a little data starts bubbling up that says, 26 of your friends read this story and 100 people have commented on it and uh, here's four related stories that happened and here's the people who have tweeted it and here's some buttons if you'd like to tweet this story out or you'd like to share it with your Facebook friends. Um, all of that data is out there, it's in the cloud. We can both collect it and do our nefarious things with it, but we can also give it back to readers, right? We can show them, here's how much of this magazine you read, here's what your friends are doing with it, here's the time of day you tend to read things. Um, we can give you better ways to save stuff. You can be reading a thing at the office or you know, at home and go, oh, I wanna finish reading this article later and click an Instapaper button so that when you go get on the subway, it's on your phone and it's not the same beautiful design, but the text is there because now I don't care about the beautiful design. I just wanna finish reading that story. Um, the scrapbook, which I mentioned at the beginning, you know, again, you ought to be able to digitally take a little screenshot of something and put it in a space that's, that's in your app. So you know when you go into that popular science app and you've got a little scrapbook of all the gadgets you meant to buy. And then, well, you ought to be able to get at that scrapbook from the web or from your phone later because why not? It's cloud, it's digital. That's where I think right now one of the things people are complaining about, I mean, you go out to the iTunes store, read reviews of any magazine. Doesn't matter what platform it's published on, doesn't matter how many movies we put in or how funky and interactive it got. People are saying one thing, too damn expensive. Um, that's partially because we all came out and said, look, this is the same package of content that you get if you get onto Barnes and Noble. In fact, it's more because we put in more images and we put in a couple of other things. So why isn't that worth $4.99 the same way that the thing down there is worth $4.99? People say, well, because you didn't have to cut down trees and you have to distribute it. And you go, well, but we did have to build a platform for it. That wasn't free. Uh, we did still have to have somebody make it specifically for this. That wasn't free. And by the way, Apple's taken 30% cut. Um, but price is what people are complaining about. They just don't see the value in it. They go, look, it's all the same content. You already made the content. You know, all you had to do, okay, you designed it a little bit differently. Um, but it's free. You can publish as much as you want here. It doesn't cost you anything. So why am I paying $4.99? I don't know that $4.99 or whatever newsstand price is is ultimately going to be the right marker for what these things ought to cost. But I do think that once you can do stuff with them, once there's a reason to get it digitally as opposed to in paper, um, and not just because you like to be seen with your iPad, uh, that's when I think there's going to be some, that's when I think there's a little bit more value in here. And you might see people say, you know, actually four ninety nine is a fair price for that. Because uh, I can do all this stuff with it that I couldn't do, I can't do in the web because either you're not putting everything out there or it's just a hassle to read out there. Um, you know, or because I can now finally, it, it integrates into my world the way that anything that's digital ought to. Um, so I think I will probably, yeah, let me pop back in here and I think I've got a couple more sort of burning questions. Um, the differences. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, good, good. Yeah, I'll talk about this a little bit first and then I'll jump on the iPad. Um, so I was talking about all these different platforms, right, and the different ways in which we're all trying to figure out how do you translate content to a screen. If you're not sort of in it every day, it's hard to notice, frankly, that there's a lot of differences, but, but there are. And it's, it's not dissimilar to the way that once you enter J school and you start reading newspaper articles or magazine articles, you notice things. Oh, this lead was a little bit different. The way they structured this is a little bit differently. The tone's a little different between these. It's critical reading. So this is basically the way to sort of critically look at the, the publication apps that are out there. And again, this is pretty magazine focused because the news is a whole different world. So reading experience is really the first one, right? Like how is the content presented? Is it in pages? Does it scroll freely up and down? Uh, is there any interactivity there? Um, how big is the text? Can I make the text a different size? Do I want to make the text a different size? Uh, is it in one column or two columns? And what's easier to read? Is it kind of weird to read two columns in this space? Does it work if I turn the device? Do I get to pick how I want to hold it or do I have to hold it in a particular way? Um, how do I discover new stories? So 
One of the things we found that's really interesting about publishing a, an issue on here is that there's no sense that it's an issue. If I've got a, a copy of a magazine, I know that it's the September Vogue or the little brochure that is often months of popular science. I know how big it is, and I know right away where I'm at in the magazine. I got a lot left, I got a little left. No sense of that here. So what clues do the publishers give you to tell you you're halfway through this magazine? Or uh, this story is 5,000 words long that you're about to get into uh, because you, you, you don't get a sense right away of that that is. You don't see necessarily all the words on the page the way that you do uh, in print. Um, and how do I know what to do? So how do, I, how do I both get around? How do I find the more stories and sort of get from page to page or jump to another page or get back to a table of contents? Um, and how do I know that I'm supposed to do that? Is there a help page? Is it kind of intuitive? Does it do what I expect it to do? And one of the things that's been really interesting doing, you know, we try to do some consumer testing around these things to answer these questions, right? Because we want to make an app that's easy to use. You don't want to frustrate people. So we go out and we ask people, you know, these questions basically, do you know what to do? How do you expect to call up a table of contents? Everybody has a different answer. And it turns out that because this is so new, nobody really knows how to use it yet. Uh, nobody really knows, no, nothing's emerged as the standard of, well, anytime I want to get a menu up, I do X. On the iPhone, it's kind of emerged that it's a tap of the screen, and most apps will bring up a menu of some kind, and then I know I can get to the choices to share or to go somewhere else. So if you talk to people who use an iPhone, they go, well, of course, you tap the screen, right? But a lot of people who are buying these are not iPhone users, and they go, well, I, I don't know, I got this one app where I, I push with two fingers, and I got another app where I double tap, so I, I don't know. Um, ask people, how do you hold it? This is a big thing for us. I mean, again, think about your designing. Uh, imagine if you had to design a magazine to work equally well whether I held it this way or whether I held it that way. This is a huge challenge in terms of actually just getting this stuff out the door and different systems have different <coughs> ways of dealing with it. So we thought, well, won't it be nice when we figure out how people want to hold the thing? You know, do you hold it this way or do you hold it this way? Uh, turns out it's 50-50. Nobody yeah, has a preference. Yeah, yeah depends entirely on the app they're using. You're playing Angry Birds, it only works one way, that's how you hold it. You open a magazine, you're kind of more accustomed to a vertical, so maybe you hold it that way, but then there's a picture that looks cool horizontal, so I turn it. One of the things we found, and one of the things the advertisers have been doing a lot of is, um, because advertisers want you to spend more time on their ad, thinking about Heineken or whatever, so one of the things they do is, in some of the systems, we don't actually even allow this in our system, is uh, you're looking at it this way and it says turn device and you turn it and then it looks, something else comes up, the ad looks different or a movie plays or something. Um, makes sense because it makes people engage with your ad, it makes people hold the device longer and turn it. Turns out people hate that because when one ad does it, they expect every page to do it. I mean, I literally watched this in videos of consumer testing, they'd be flipping along, perfectly happy, reading their magazine, they'd get to one of these ads, they'd go, oh, that's kind of cool, and they'd turn it and it would do something else, that's cool. And they'd turn the page to an edit page that said nothing about turning it and they'd go, yeah, yeah. And same thing if you tried to lock the orientation, which some of the magazines have done because it's kind of a hassle to build it twice. So in some, uh, some people said, forget it. SI came out, Sports Illustrated launched working both ways, and they came out and literally said in the press, explained it by saying, we're not making a money, enough money on this to pay designers to design it twice. So now it works horizontally, deal with it. Um, but they didn't really say that terribly clearly when they did it. And so... Uh, when we put that in front of them as opposed to, actually no, it's unfair, they did it right. Pop Mechanics was one that came out, Popular Mechanics came out, it was a really nice app that only works horizontally, but there was no indication that it only worked horizontally, it never said that. Um, and so, and even though you'd turn it and it didn't do anything, it still never said. So what we noticed when we did the testing, we put these two in front of people was, Sports Illustrated, they didn't mind that it was locked, they didn't care that there wasn't a second orientation because they knew right away that's how you're supposed to do it. With Pop Mechanics, the reaction kept being, uh, I think my device is broken. Is there a switch where I can turn off the thing? Because I think I've accidentally locked it somehow. The lesson out of all of this is basically um, don't frustrate people. Don't, don't, well, the editor-in-chief of Popular Science when I started working there, a guy named Scott Mowbray, who now edits Cooking Light, used to say as kind of a mandate for us editing Pop Sci was uh, people don't like to feel stupid or they don't like to be made to feel stupid. Um, and I always kept that in my head when I was editing Popular Science, and I'm not a science guy, so it was really easy for me to know when a person who didn't know science would feel stupid, as I often did there. Um, but the same thing kind of applies here. If you do something, if you make it work in a way that people don't expect it to work, they feel stupid for not understanding that. They feel stupid for feeling frustrated. Um, what makes it particularly challenging to design for that is that you don't know what people's expectations are. So. All of that's kind of a long thing around navigation, but it is a really sort of key thing to 
the bigger questions at hand here, which is ultimately, do people want to read stuff on this? Do they want to read long stuff? Do they want to read short stuff? Do they want things that blink at them? Do they want movies? Do they want things that spin around and tap? We don't know. Uh, I wish I knew. We keep asking them. I don't really have any clear answers yet. Um, and a lot of it will probably come down to, well, how do we do it? Do we make it easy? Do we make it fun? Do we make it intuitive? Um, or do we frustrate them? Because, and I've done this myself. I mean, I have to look at these magazines for my job, but I'll go into some of these magazines and they're just a hassle to get around. I don't know how to get back to the home screen. I don't know how to find new things. I'm flipping this way. It doesn't work. I don't go back to that magazine. Even if I like the magazine, I'll go buy the paper version. It's just easier. That's really not what we want to hear if we want people to sort of move into this world. Um, so this actually leads nicely into the burning questions, and then we'll yeah. all stop talking and yeah. we'll talk a little bit. Um, who's buying these things? Uh, you know, Apple keeps that data pretty well guarded. Dan, um, Dan. Dan buys them. Dan buys yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, who, who's gifting them? Um, I'm just curious. So who has an iPad? So Dan has an iPad. Who else has an iPad? OK, who's waiting for the second generation? <laughs> okay. I was waiting so. until somebody buys one for you because they're six, seven, eight hundred bucks. Yeah, well, right. a, yeah, yeah. I have a birthday coming up if anybody's interested. Yeah. Or if you get a job in the industry, you can expense it. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, and then you can expense it every time a new one comes out. Because um, I, I, to be honest, I wouldn't probably own this thing if I didn't have to own it. Uh, I think it's awesome. I think it's cool. I haven't yet figured out exactly how, other than my work, it fits into my life. And for seven, eight hundred bucks, eh. it's a big question. Yeah, it is. It's a big, it's a big you know, if it was two, three hundred bucks, I might be like, all right, it's a birthday present or Christmas, I'll splurge on it. We'll figure out what we're going to do with it. Seven, eight hundred bucks, I don't know. And the new tablets, the Motorola Zoom, which is coming, is going to be eight hundred bucks. Um, maybe a little cheaper if you get like some kind of plan with it or something. Um, that's another big question in terms of like, well, who's buying and who's going to buy? Um, what do they want? This is what we were just talking about. What do they want to do with these things? Do they want to watch movies? So one of the things we found, it's, and there's tons of different surveys about this and different data points, and again, frankly, it's too early to believe much of what you read, but it has emerged that it seems pretty clear at this point in some of the research that people do like to read. They read books on it, whether through Kindle or through iBooks. Uh, they do seem to like magazines. Not that any of us are selling a ton of them, but if you ask people what they like to do or what they want to do on it, they do apparently like reading magazines. I wish more of them would then buy them. Um, Mike, can you just give a quick sense of yeah. how many magazines are being sold? Yeah, the, so the best, the best selling, um, well, not everybody releases their numbers, but I think this is, I, I'm pretty confident in, in this answer. Uh, the best selling magazine out there is Wired. Um, they, their first issue came out in June. They sold like 105,000 copies. Their total rate base, their total circa 600,000. So that's huge. Um, they charged $4.99 for that. Apple keeps a chunk. It means they made three bucks a piece, so they, you know, I'm not a math person, but they made a lot of money on that one. Um, then they dropped precipitously. They cut the price by a buck, so it's $3.99, and they dropped off to like $20,000, and they've leveled at about twenty twenty-two thousand. Um, and how do you interpret that? The drop or the sales? Yeah, I mean. Uh, I think the drop was to be expected. I mean, what, what I think all of us have seen, and we've certainly seen at PopSci, so at PopSci, we average about 10,000 a month, um, and we're by far the best selling of the Bonnier titles. Um, after that, it starts to fall quite a bit. Trans World Snowboarding, which is a beautiful magazine, looks really awesome on this. Tons of great pictures, cool videos. They're selling like 1,000 a month. Um, now, again, you're just talking about a niche audience and then an even further niche audience, you know, snowboarders who own an iPad. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and we figured that was, of all those pubs, we figured that was probably the best one. Um, but uh, the, the drop, I think, was to sort of be expected. You know, one of the things we've noticed um, is the repeat purchase rate is terrible. So at PopSci, we average like 10,000 a month. The repeat purchasers is like 5%, 6%. Good hmm. month, maybe 8%. Hmm. One hand, it's good because it means that there's now, whatever, 130,000 people who have tried the app. It's not just the same eight people buying it over and over again. Um, on the other hand, it means something's, they don't like it enough. Either it's too expensive, they got frustrated by it. Probably uh, what I think is the case is that the people who are buying the magazine apps on here now, it's not that they're diehard PopSci subscribers. They're people who just bought an iPad and they're looking for something to do with it and they recognize that brand. Hmm. Um, and so that's why I think you got PopSci and Wired are the two best-selling titles on it and probably now the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue. Um, 
because it's an intersection of the kind of people who are probably buying this right away and what, they're, what brands they recognize and what they go, oh, I kind of like that, I'll check that out. I do think the subscriptions is going to be a really interesting, as Lee mentioned, Apple unveiled a subscription plan this week for the first time, and there's been a few titles, that, including the journal, who have had ways around Apple's world before and have managed to sell it, but for the most part, the magazine industry has not had subscriptions as, as of now, and it's really what the magazine industry is built on. There, with a few exceptions, Cosmo, Men's Health, who do a lot of business on newsstands, most of us do 10% of our circulation on newsstands, and the rest is all circulation, and, and because it's... Question back there? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, please. Please do, no, otherwise please. I, I will literally keep going For until God's midnight sake, if somebody doesn't interrupt me. Please. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess my question is, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about right now is kind of like mechanical, in terms of like, the people mm -hmm. who are buying it, they don't want to watch videos, they want to subscribe. Um, my question is kind of like, the people who are buying it is to be like you said, a subset of the population. Do you think about content in terms of like, yeah. what Thank kind you. of articles the people who are buying it want, and in terms of like, cost value or right. whatever? Uh, and how do the nature of those stories change, or should they change as the platform? Yeah, that's a really good question and a good segue into where we, sh we should yeah, take this conversation. Yeah, you've been talking about, about this as a designer. Right. Now talk to us about this as an editor. Right. So it's a really interesting thing, and, and what's interesting about this is that what you see out on the ed so the, the short answer to that question is no, and here's why. Because the way that media companies have thought about this when they started down this path a year ago and they poured all their R&D money into Adobe or us or whomever uh, is if we can get people to buy our magazine this way, we don't have to pay for paper postage and distribution and uh, this will, if not save us, it will certainly help our business. So, so what they thought about was the, the, the terms they framed it in was let's take the magazine, that package of content that we already do and we already know people like, um, and let's just put it in a form that people can get here and it's digital and we'll distribute. It's about distribution, frankly, at that point. They weren't doing a lot of thinking of, and, and in part this is because we didn't know who was going to buy them and we still kind of don't. Um, and I would say the only kind of yes to that question is, well, we started with popular science and not with parenting or not with wakeboarding um, or with some of our other, or outdoor life who desperately want to come on it and the company keeps telling them, but your people don't have iPads, they have guns. Um, I guess you could have both, I don't know. Um, it's hard to hold them both, I mean. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so where I think this starts to get interesting and where I think we start to go from here, and, and there's already a ton of talk about it in, in our, with our publishers, and, and not just with PopSci, but you know, I talk to a lot of publishers now as I'm out with my sales hat on trying to sell this platform. Uh, that's the question I hear a lot is, well, I don't, does it make sense to just publish my monthly magazine on this, especially when there's only 15 million of these out there, it's still a pretty small universe, people aren't moving a lot of downloads. Um, maybe I should be trying to make content specifically to reach that audience. Um, I've really wanted and I just haven't had the time to. Uh, I want to come up with a magazine. So the way you may typically make a magazine is you have a content idea and then you have a, a reader, you know, in my, what, what do people want? What do I want to write about? What do people want and who's going to pay for it in terms of an advertising? It's three stools of the leg. You know, normally the way it happens, or at least in a sort of ideal world, in a J-school world, uh, is you come up with an awesome idea for content, and then you figure out what your universe of people is, and then you go out and you find some advertisers who hopefully pay for it. I want to build an iPad magazine uh, starting with the other two legs. I want to figure out exactly who's buying and who owns these. What's the, what's the common things among everybody who owns these, or the biggest sort of group there? Um, what advertisers are spending money in this space? So if you went through and did what ad people call tear sheeting, which is just look through an issue to see what, what advertisers are in there. If you look through all the magazines that are out there, Wired Us, Time, Sports Illustrated, and saw, is it financial, is it car companies, is it, is it corporate branding? Who's spending money in this space? Who's dumping dollars into this for, frankly, not much return at this point? Um, put those two things together and then figure out what the content is. I think that'd be a really interesting, I, I, I don't know what you'd end up with. We were debating this the other day with the designer at PopSci and we figured out you'd probably end up like building a, a magazine about iPad apps um, <laughs> or maybe financial iPad apps, I don't know. Financial iPad apps. Yeah, um, or you just end up making angry birds, I don't know. Um, but I do think that that's, and that's when we talk about some of these other platforms, again, it's kind of on the technical side, but the tool set by which you publish actually has a lot to do with that question, right? Because if it's, if it's expensive or if it's hard or if it's going to take a lot of long time, 
I got to think really hard about it. And I also, that's the less time and less money I have to create that original content. The other reason you're seeing Popular Science and Wired on here is because, well, we've already got it. So we're just putting it out there. As soon as you say to the, to the edit team, uh, I need a new section, I need a new whatever for this, they go, I'm, I got a full-time job. And, and there's not enough money coming in on this, no matter what we've built so far, um, to justify hiring a new edit team to come in and, and do it. If we can start to get some of this world where the tools are cheaper um, and where anybody who wants to can put out a, a title, an issue, a, a magazine, you know, because it's almost like back to the zine world we had in the 90s where people would go to like photocopiers and make little zines. It's, you can do that now because if you can get the tool set down um, and that's cheap so you can build it, nice, beautiful, immersive things, and the distribution is free. I mean, Apple's going to take a cut, but it doesn't cost you anything. It's $99 for an app developer account, and, and you can have an app out there in the, in the world, and, you know, and that's free. That's where I think, I, I do liken this to sort of the blogging thing. I really think that's where, and particularly if these take off and people buy Android tablets, and there is more than just the kind of elite subset of iPad owners, I think this is going to be like that time when, you, when, when publishing got sort of democratized in another way and, and you know the and we can we can argue about whether you know blogging was ultimately a good thing for writing or not you know that that, that it let everybody blah 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 on forever with no editors and no limitations um, this I think is going to be interesting because I just think if you're making issues um, you're gonna you're gonna just think more about sort of curation you're gonna I'm really into World of Warcraft I want to put out a World of Warcraft magazine and um, and I hope that along with the notion of curation, of thinking about what stuff my readers might want to read, and the notion of design, and I want to make it sort of beautiful for them, cool images, videos, whatever it means, I hope the notion of editing comes back into it. I hope that's something that sort of comes along with that. Now I'm not just spewing forth to the world, but I'm trying to make a really cool little package of things. I hope that, I don't know how this happens, maybe with all the unemployed magazine editors, we all go get jobs doing this. But I hope that people understand that crafting the words and crafting the stories and being smart about knowing when to stop writing, um, you know, comes back into it. And we get this world in which people like me or like you uh, aren't the only ones who are producing magazine quality journalism. You know, that, it, that all the people who are blogging now get to be better editors. I mean, you can argue that blogging has made people sort of better writers in a way because there's just more uh, practice to doing it. I hope the same thing happens for editing. It's sort of a rant about editing, but yeah. so we have a question somebody down interrupt me yeah. before I keep talking about editing. No, I have no idea. No, I think it's decades. Um, we'll all have flying cars in decades. Um, We're talking six months. <laughs> I mean, we literally may be talking six months. I mean, yeah. it, the pace of change, the pace of adoption, we used to have this, I got it somewhere on my computer, we used to have this really interesting um, chart that showed the, the pace of adoption for, um, for the iPhone. No, I think it started with the iPod um, and the kind of curve of where that went. And then it went into iTunes and that curve and how much faster that got before people started getting into iTunes and doing things. Then we put the iPhone over and it was even faster, just a much faster ramp up. This is even faster than that. So the pace of change of how quickly these things are happening, I mean, I keep talking about there's only 15 million. Well, there's 15 million in like eight months. I mean, this is an incredibly rapid thing. My big question is, does that keep going or does it sort of level off? That's going to, I think, sort of determine the answer to that question. If we end up with a world, if in six months, and there are predictions, I mean, there are big important uh, technology companies who will tell you in six months there's going to be 30 million tablets out there, or 40 million tablets, or 100 million tablets by the end of 2013. If that's the world we live in, then I think that happens faster. Because then if I'm a person thinking about building a tool set that I want the world to use, or I'm a person thinking about what I want to publish, I got a really big audience to do it for. Um, if it's a, a world in which there are 20 million iPad, 20 million tablets, and they're all iPads, and the only people who are buying them are sort of geeky early adopter folks, then maybe there's not as much impetus for that sort of thing to happen, for that to take off. Um, and it's a really, op I, and I, I'm not sort of being evasive, I honestly don't know. I go back and forth on this all the time, depending on who I'm talking to and what I hear about. Is every household going to have one of these? Will this replace, you know, now everybody's got a computer, right? And it's stupid to think you'd have a household, most of us, without a computer in it. That might be where we end up with this. Well, of course you have one of these, and I didn't bother replacing my desktop PC because, well, I do everything on this, so I, why would I want that big thing over in the corner, or even a laptop, you know, which is twice as expensive? Um, that might be the world we live in. I hope so.
because then it gets more interesting for all these publishing things. Well, so far, we've been talking about this from a magazine perspective, and it's really interesting. And I'm hoping in a minute, maybe you'll show us oh, yeah, me, uh, yeah. what PopSci has, has done with this on the FN. But I mean, it, it seems to me when I listen, there, there, there are three things going, or three, three experiments going. Um, and, and you've talked to us about the magazine thing. I mean, there's the newspaper experiment, which goes to the earlier question, which is purely information driven. The Wall Street Journal is kind of the avatar of that. Uh, I write a story, it goes on the web, it goes on the Blackberry, it goes on the Kindle, it goes on the iPad. We have a lovely iPad app, but it's, um, it's a template. Right. You know, and information pours into that at a high speed and pours out onto the floor, you know. Um, and then there's this other thing, which we have alluded to a little bit, uh, we keep using the atavist as the mm -hmm. example, where it's a uh, artinis, ar artinisonal publishing, where here are a group of people who are experimenting with a way to allow nonfiction writers, science writers, journalists, to write something longer than a magazine article, shorter than a book, mm -hmm. Uh, and give them a way to tailor it to the technological capacities of the iPad. Flip in movies, flip in links, do whatever they want. I mean, it's, I don't know how many pieces they've published, not very many. Um, that's something that, you know, we might do. I mean, the News Corps will do the information fire hose. Associated Press, we're blessed with this presence here today, will do the information fire hose app. Um, and you'll do the highly uh, designed, beautiful, uh, gorgeously curated, um, large brand publishing app, whether it's Popular Science or another Condé Nast thing or Wired. Um, and then there's this other thing. And I, and I wonder from where you sit what you think about that grassroots experiment, if that's fair to call the atavist idea. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you see that as something that's really got possibilities, or is that one of those goofy things that people do when they're presented with new technology? Ah, uh, we'll all publish, uh, you know, with, uh, with on our iPods. Remember that? Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think it's, I think it is sort of a goofy experiment, but I think, um, I think there's definitely room for something interesting to happen there. So I actually have the atavist up here. Oh, super. Um, Thank you. And so. Uh, as Lee just described this, if I click on an article now, um, you know, I can... And it's text. It's and it's text. It's words. Until no. I click one of these. Well, where do I go? Uh -huh. And then I get these little things that say, oh, there's yeah. more stuff there. It's yeah. kind of an ingenious little way, actually, with the depth to do that. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit disturbing, but... Um, I, wow, that's a creepy picture. I'm sure this I makes sense this if you're um, reading the article. I think this is a piece they did called The Heist, which was a, a, a huge... in depth deconstruction of a big oh, right. bank robbery. Um, so I think what is, I think what's challenging about this is I'm not sure, well, it's harder for me to figure out why I'm going to an app to get this as opposed to the web because it is just text. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's because you know I don't have that sort of blinky, banner-filled world around me. So maybe that has value that this is more of a reader in the same way that you know Kindle mm -hmm. or iBooks might be. Um, the other challenge is, and, and you know, bless them for trying, is uh, I think they're going to have an even harder time getting people to pay for it, um, to pay for these articles, and to pay a buck ninety-nine or two ninety-nine for them, especially when an entire magazine is four ninety-nine. You know, even at its at its highest price. Um, why does that keep moving? Oh, I see. Um, I think where that, that's going to succeed and what they have the, what I think they might be able to do is, is with the curation aspect. Again, if I know that everything I pay for at the Atavist is awesome because the bar is just really high there, to get in the Atavist to be able to publish in that space um, is something really special. Mm -hmm. If I know that that's going to be worth my buck ninety nine, then I might pay it there, and then I might, you know, um, then I might get enough out of this platform in terms of a nice, easy reading experience that's uninterrupted until I choose to interrupt it by hitting one of these buttons. Um, but I think there's a lot of other places where that kind of thing, this sort of, um, you know, te 
technological avenues for long form journalism comes up. I don't know if you guys know about um, the Twitter hashtag long reads. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of awesome, right? It's just stories that are out there on the web, um, a lot of them old magazine stories that people grab and tweet out with the hashtag long reads. Um, and I use this constantly now. That and Instapaper makes up like most of my reading. I, end of the day, I'll look at the Twitter feed for long reads. I'll grab three, four stories that I like. I'll hit the Instapaper button on my laptop so that then on my phone, I've just always got this great repository of, of stories I know are awesome, cool magazine stories that I can read. Um, you know, how that kind of thing interacts with this kind of thing, I don't know. You know, I, I do think that the Design and all that, design and issue base is one thing we're sort of talking about that you can do on here and you can do with an app space, but I think the curation is the other big piece of that. I think somebody, I'll pay for people to cut through the crap for me. I'll pay for people who I trust, whether that's the guys at the Atavist uh, or another brand, to tell me what the good sort of long form journalism things are. And then, and, and to find the ones out there, you know, we're talking about this democratization of it, right? Like any of you guys could go out and write a 5,000 word story and publish it out to the world your problem is getting me to notice it, because it might be awesome, but mm -hmm. how do I find that? And it's a really big problem in the App Store. I mean, on one hand, the App Store is beautiful because, again, anybody can publish an app and be out there. On the other hand, it sucks because there's 300,000 of yeah. them out there and it's impossible to find them. Um, that's, again, where I think the curation aspect is going to come into it. If you can create these avenues, whether they're sort of websites or optimized websites or apps themselves, that I know I can go to find the coolest young writers, that would be great. we have a question down here? Yeah, I mean, I think that notion of the, the planned obsolescence, and I mean, you're, you're right, that is a lot of what drives consumer electronics now. I mean, the flip side of that is part of the reason you get new stuff coming out is that it has new features. It's more powerful. It has a better, beautiful, more beautiful screen on it. It has the ability to render animations in a way that 10 years ago computers didn't do very well. Um, the trick in there, I think, is just to have some kind of standard, some kind of something that we can keep publishing to so that we don't have to change our tool set every two years. Um, I mean, that said, I do think it's just a reality that we're all going to have to live with, that the spaces we publish in and the business models that surround them and what customers do around them are just going to change more quickly than they did before. We had a really lovely period of a couple hundred years in which it was paper and paper bound together. and. We don't live in that world anymore, and we're not going back to it. Like, that'll always be there. I'm, I'm totally bullish on paper. I don't think paper's going away for a long, long time. But there's going to be a lot of other avenues out there, and they're going to change really, really rapidly. So it's, I think it's a mixed bag. Here? Right in this? Oh, sure. Can, can, Do you mind if I interject? Oh, yeah, please. No, go ahead. Besides the fact that they're early adopters, is there any special reason to think that science content in particular would change in particular ways based, based, based on the size of the platform, you know, based, you know, based on the, the fact that we're in, in, we were talking about in cash now? Would that? I can think of a I'm just, I'm just trying, just yeah. trying to think what, what would be distinct about science content? Well, I think 
Probably a couple of different things. The one thing that comes to mind right away, and we've talked a lot about it, or I've talked a lot, a lot with the people who are still at Popular Science Publishing, is, um, and the web kind of let us do this, but just not quite in the same way, is um, the ability to do uh, visuals with the content, you know, to do animated infographics. I mean, we'd spend so much time at Popular Science working on our infographics and trying to explain these really difficult concepts um, through visuals, and it would just been so much easier if we could have just made it move for about five seconds and go, oh, the blood flows this way, or the, the wheel turns this thing, um, as opposed to having to do arrows and a an whole, whole bunch of text to do it. So I think in that way, it, it these platforms and these devices, um, you know, because they're, they're beautiful at the screens, they're powerful at doing animations, I think that's one way it's going to change. I think it's going to make the visual that much more important. Also because people expect, we think, it kind of seems like maybe people expect things to move a little bit on here. They don't expect static images as good as they might look. Um, and they like some level of interactivity. They like to kind of be able to touch it themselves and move, a, some, you know, move a, an infographic through its cycle. Um, so I do think that thing of being able to think not just in words, but in pictures about how your thing translates. And this is true, I mean, if you went to the journal, if you went to the Times to write, um, your, your article's gonna go online, and the online guys probably want mm -hmm. some kind of infographic with it. So that's one way I think this is only, it's already happening, I think this is only gonna increase it. Um, the other is this notion of, um, you know, of sort of democratizing it. I just think that, I mean, one of the things I always loved about working at, at Pop Size, a non-science guy, is that the whole mandate of that magazine is to take the coolest stuff that's happening out there in the world and make sure that everybody who wants to can understand it. Um, if, if, these, if there's 100 million of these out here and one of the things people are doing is reading on it, they're not gonna stop reading on online. Um, they're, gonna, they're just gonna read more. It's just gonna be more people looking for and reading more content. Um, which just means there's more demand for whatever kind of content it is. But I mean, if you if you marry up the fact that uh, you know how much uh, I don't know how to say. It. I mean, it sounds really strange to say like so much is happening in science today. Um, but it's it's kind of true, right? Like there's more to write about. Um, I'm sure you guys find that. Um, if there's more places to publish, it just means there's even more opportunities. Does it change the kinds of stories you might assign? I mean, I know, for instance, at the journal, there are stories that I will write for our website because I know I can include sound right. in particular, that I wouldn't bother with the print edition. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, you know, I don't think with every story, but I think it can. I mean, I, I can think of the same thing. There's, I, I remember sitting in story meetings with Pop Sci where we'd go, uh, you know, we want to do this story, but just, there's just no way we're going to be able to translate this into words. It's just, it's just going to be a hassle. It's never going to make sense. And a lot of times we tried and failed. You know, there's a lot of spreads I could point to that we did of infographics that are just a mess. Um, that I would be much more likely to do on here if I knew I had the budget to do that moving infographic with it or the sound or whatever else. Um, and then the other way I think it'll change what you assign is this notion of, we were talking about audience before, you know, once you have a sense of um, who these people are, mm -hmm. maybe this ends up being a more educated crowd. So my, my slightly uh, more complex, more, uh, you know, intricate stuff goes into here in some way. Or maybe this becomes more the democratized platform. Maybe this is the more mass platform and, and the paper is what actually holds the more sort of, because the paper ends up being the premium thing and that, that holds the sort of longer reads. Or maybe we find that it turns out that people don't like to read more than two, 3,000 words on this. So my longer stories still go in the paper version and maybe the paper version becomes more of like a, I mean, if you go back to what, the way popular science started for the first 40 years, it was a journal. I mean, it wasn't a mm -hmm. glossy magazine, it was a journal. Maybe that's what popular science, the magazine goes back to and this becomes my highly visualized, you know, moving sort of thing. Um, yeah. That's it here. Um, well, actually, you brought up a point that I like Hmm. All your articles. To me, that would be, may, give you a unique claim uh, in your in your platform. To say, hey, look, use Mag Three, and and you can curate, you can, you can create an audio version of all your articles as part of the platform, and, do, and that's the reason people would buy the app because they can they can listen to the articles every time. We we haven't actually. We talked a little bit about that and about sound and how that comes in. Um, we haven't talked a lot about doing it. I think just because there's not a lot of evidence yet that um, 
that that's one of the things people are doing with this. Like we know on, you know, people do a lot of audiobooks on the phones and on their iPods. Um, they like to listen to things in that way because they're out doing something else. They got the headphones in and they want to listen. With this, it seems like, you know, one of the sort of usage patterns seems to be I'm sitting on the couch with it. Maybe the TV's on in the background, but I'm kind of looking at this. Um, if that's the, you know, if that's the case, then it's just a matter of figuring out do people want to sit, have this in their lap and just listen to it, or do they expect to be more engaged with it and less sort of passive in that way? I don't know, it'd be an interesting experience to do. Well, I think your, your focus on the community element is you're dead right, and you know, you've got a huge history of success. I don't know if everyone here knows how successful the popular science online publication is, and you know, the genius guys are very proud Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting thing to try. I mean, I think that's what, that's what's cool about this is it's not just words. You know, it's, we were talking the other day about you know, one of the questions I had up here is, you know, what is an issue? What is a magazine? What mm -hmm. is a, yeah. a thing? You know, we think it's words and pictures. Now on this, it's not quite words and pictures. It's words and pictures and movies. Well, what if it is audio? And, and I always think, you know, when I think about broadly defining a magazine, I think of This American Life, because to me, This American Life is a magazine. It's just a radio magazine. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a curated package of stuff with a point of view that I get every month. I know what I'm going to get from it. It speaks to a certain audience. All those things that define a magazine. So is there a way to do that on here? Because you can bind the This American Life TV show that they did with the radio thing, and it would be in a little issue I would consume here. That might be pretty cool. Yeah, excuse me to follow up on that. I was wondering about the technology another screen, another content provider. Are people able to actually create things on that? Or are you focusing on people's interactivity and being able to leave their own mark? I know that one of the things you mentioned earlier was that you know one of the beauties of having a magazine was you didn't have to have all the comments at the bottom. Mm -hmm. But have you looked into whether or not people are actually wanting to do things for themselves on this you know, new device? Right, so is, so is the question sort of like, is this also, is this, is this not just a consumption device, but also a creative device? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's something, you know, again, it, it kind of broad, high-level trends that you're starting to see out of the research, that's one of them. And if you download something like, um, you know, Pages, which is the word processor thing, or Keynote, if you're like me and you have to build presentations all day long, it's kind of brilliant to do it with your fingers rather than with a mouse. It's really sort of interesting and intuitive to just move things around that way. And certainly lots of really cool painter apps and that kind of stuff. And so that is one of the things we've been thinking about is how do you preserve that one experience that you wanted to create, this sort of curated design experience for people, but then let them break that? Um, you know, what if you entered into a second mode and they can take that headline and toss it out of the way if they want to? The very basic way we've talked about it, how it'll first sort of come in is, um, is with this notion of scrapbooking, that you can cut things out, you can put them into another space, you can organize them around, you can, there'll be a little drawing tool you can draw on top of it, you can annotate things, then you can take a screenshot of that and send it off to a friend. So it is that kind of like remix the magazine. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think exploiting that more and more, that, that consumption versus creativity is something you can definitely do on these. Yeah, so we got a couple people in the queue here. Yeah, Renee here has a question. Oh. So how, how your job as an editor is going to change? Um, it's going to get busier is kind of the, you know, because, because what's going to happen is, you know, if your company now you're doing Zinio, which is sort of you don't really have to think about the digital edition, if they at some point, because somebody up higher says you should or because they see a business opportunity, say we want to sign on with Adobe or Mag Plus or whatever, and we want to start making this, or we want to start doing special issues, we want to start making content specifically for the audience here, uh, they're not going to go out and hire 10 new people to do it. They're going to come to you and say, hey, could you also do a piece for this? Could you assign another thing? Could you ask your writer to get to also film a movie when he goes out or to or you know gather in more things? Um, 
I mean, we saw it a little bit with the web. I mean, I'm sure you've been through this, that, and this happened at every magazine staff I know, and probably in newspapers as well, where it was just expected that you were now going to, your job now wasn't just about paper. You also had to contribute in some way to the website, whether that was blogging or getting these extra assets. This is another thing. And what's interesting about this, and I've looked at some of the magazine, you know, working with some of the magazine staffs doing it is, um, people seem to be in generally sort of less annoyed by that. And I don't know if it's just because it's new and they're sort of interested in working on it, or if it's that, and I see this a lot actually in younger, the younger editors who come in, um, I think are coming in with that expectation now. You, come, you, you get hired now and you don't expect that your job is only gonna be paper. You kind of realize that your job is to, is to make cool content that speaks to these audiences and hit them wherever they want to be hit. So you know that you're going to have to blog in the morning and then you're going to have to edit and sign this print story and then you're going to have to come up with a you know, movie for the designers who do the iPad version and then you've got to figure out what you're going to put to the iPhone RSS reader thing and it's just sort of part of it. Um, and it also means then not just a time thing about, well, how am I going to break my day up, but having to think in very different ways because you're still curating, you're still, you know, all of those skills of editing only more important in this world. You know, just there's more channels, but you're still, you're still serving an audience who wants a particular thing from you. You're still you know, bringing your curation and your packaging and your storytelling ability to it. But now you're going to have to think about it in four or five different channels, not just front of book versus a feature. But um, this is my iPad version, and they read this way. And what about how it's the angle on the story for the web? And um, a pain, possibly, but also maybe kind of fun. So do you think people read differently on the iPad? I know, like, for instance, at National Geographic now, they've got a whole iPad conglomerate beavering away, and, and they will talk a lot amongst themselves about, oh, it's a different reading experience, and we have to cut stories up a different way. We have to write differently for the iPad. Do you buy into that? No, I don't think we know yet. Um, I mean, I could proffer theories. It's, it would be based on nothing other than my own opinion. I just, I don't think there's enough people reading, enough feedback from the people who are reading um, for us to know. I mean iBooks and Kindle are apparently doing very well, I've heard, which suggests to me that people are reading books in some way on this, um, that Kindle's whole argument about having a screen on is terrible, that people don't seem to be bothered by that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know, and I th it's, it is one of the burning questions of uh, does it change the way they read? Do they expect it to be more interactive? Do, do they expect it to be more passive? Uh, is there a length, you know? And then it comes down to what we were talking about earlier, like the kind of fundamental differences between it. Do they expect to read this way, you know, the way that, that uh, we do on the Kindle, or does it make more sense uh, to wait for something to load, um, you know, to read up and down, which this one doesn't do, but the way I do on the phone, and does that make a difference in how much people will read? So one of the things our platform does is getting technical, but we don't do text this way. We do a free scrolling column of text. You can break that if you want to, but we do it that way. Based on testing we did in which uh, people complain about swipe fatigue, and if you if you hmm. make it move in page size swipe chunks, fatigue. and you try to do a 5,000 word story, well, that's 25 pages this size because they're smaller things, and you got to make the font big enough to read, and they start swiping, and after about you know, they're just conscious of the fact that they've had to keep swiping this. Whereas if you let them, if if the experience is instead just kind of this, you're just moving it up with your thumb, you're just kind of casually. Uh, you're not paying attention to how many times you've swiped, how many pages you went through, but you're just slowly scrolling up, they wouldn't, they would read further um, before they stopped. I mean, and, and again, if the story was interesting enough, it would keep them going, and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. they'd be at the bottom of the story without realizing they had mm -hmm. just read 5,000 words. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, as it happens, and I, and I know we have another question out here, so you'll forgive me for a sec. As it happens, you've pulled up a, a page from The Daily, mm -hmm. which, for those of you who don't know, is News Corp's experimental iPad only, iPad staff only newspaper, which they just started up. And I wonder what you think of it. Uh, I have no dog in this fight, so you're not going to offend me. Um, what you think of it and what you think about the relationship, if this thing is successful or not, is it successful because of its content or is it successful because it's a cool iPad app? And what's the relationship there? Yeah, I, I like. I like that it's out there trying something. I like that. I like mm -hmm. the experimentation, and thank God there's somebody like Rupert who goes, yeah, it's going to cost us a whole bunch of money, but whatever. Um, let's just try it and see what happens. Um, I like that they're pushing a subscription model that's 40 bucks a year or 99 cents a week. I think that's kind of an interesting price point. Like, I'd pay that for the Times. I don't know if I'd pay it for this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
you know, from a, from a usability side, I think it's, I was really disappointed in it, in, in sort of the interface, particularly because they work closely with Apple, because it's not terribly innovative. I mm -hmm. think it's kind of a pain to use. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like reading on it. I'm not a fan of this sort of like, I'm <coughs> pretending that this is a print page with these sort of edges, so I have these two columns of text and I've got, I mean, the, the also, you know, I've got these terrible widows on there. Maybe this is kind of a magazine guy, but that drives me nuts. Um, you know, I just don't think it feels particularly optimized for this screen and, and terribly innovative in a way that mm -hmm. that presenting daily news probably could have been. It's more just taking the kind of thing and, and you know, the most innovative part of it is is this interface right here, which Apple did with CoverFlow like three years ago. Sure. Um, and a content-wise, I don't think it's great. I mean, I get what they're doing. The whole point is it's the USA Today of the iPad. People don't want to read long stories on it. They want to want in-depth news, so we'll give them the little bite-sized things. But it, and I've not read a, a ton of it, but what I have mm -hmm. read has just not been all that interesting um, and been sort of unsatisfying. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of a split mind about it. I don't want to come out and say I don't like it, but I think it has a lot of room to go. And I don't think this is going to be remembered as anything other than the first thing that was tried, a big mm -hmm. media company putting a bunch of money into it. Somebody will get, somebody, some small company in the Valley will get much more interesting and creative about how to present, you know, daily, mm -hmm. a daily package of news as mm -hmm. opposed to the constant, the, the information yeah. fire hose sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, in the dog years of the iPad, you know, I mean, uh, where every month is a decade. I mean, is there a lesson here? I mean, can you extract something from this? Probably not yet. I think we'll have to see where it goes. Because I might end up being wrong. It might end up that the world thinks this is awesome and this is exactly the kind of content they want and they sell a billion of these. Um, you know, this might become a, a huge uh, app. I mean, I know it, it shot up right away out of, I think, interest. It'll be interesting to see where it stays. Um, that also helps. Um, but yeah, once it's... There's a business model. <laughs> once it's being paid for, then we'll see. Right now, I, I you know... I guess the only lesson I take out of this now is that Apple doesn't always blow me away. Sometimes they do stuff and you go, really, you're putting your name on this? Sometimes they miss. <laughs> yeah. No. I quit being an editor. <laughs> That's how I balance. I mean, literally, you know, it's a really relevant question. I, I was spending, I was trying to do both. I was running the feature well at Pop's Eye um, and building this. And, um, and I didn't have time for that. And this world is so, so much more uh, frantic and happens so much quicker and all day long is spent answering emails. And it's not, as writers certainly, and, and, and also as editors, and particularly editors of long form stuff, um, I don't find any way, maybe other people work differently, that the frantic, adrenaline-driven world of, um, oh my God, Apple just launched subscriptions, and we need this now, and I gotta do this interview, and I'm emailing these, is not conducive to me doing a nice edit on a 5,000 word story. I need a morning when nobody bugs me, and I can turn off email, and I can kind of dive into it, and certainly when I'm writing, I need that. Um, maybe that's because I'm a magazine and not a newspaper guy, or I'm more accustomed to sort of churning things out. Um, I think that's gonna be a real tension, when you're, when you're a real, uh, challenge when your attention is pulled in all these different directions, how do you uh, continue to do that kind of artistic work and that kind of, you know, immersive work that you need to do? No. <laughs> no, they either leave and go do, like I did, they either, you know, wimp out and go be a software guy or else they, uh, um, or else they, they fight and, and whine and complain when people ask them to do something for the iPad and they go put their time into the story instead. And, I, and when they do it, I kind of quietly say, thank God you did, because mm -hmm. I want that 5,000 word story to still be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I hope it gets on the iPad too, but I don't want it to suck. No. No, there's, there's some screen technologies out there that I think are gonna solve this problem. I mean, in some ways it's kind of already solved because it's not really that bad to read on this thing. Battery life is getting a lot better, but there's a couple of screen technologies that don't 
have, but they let you do all sorts of color and nice stuff like this, but don't have backlight so you can turn the backlight off. The whole Kindle thing will, um, it'll probably slowly go away. I mean, now it's there because it is nice to read on and it's cheap, um, but. Um, the battery lasts a month? And the battery lasts a month, unless you leave the Wi-Fi on and then it goes away really quickly. I told that, so I gave my wife a Kindle and I was like, oh, the battery lasts a month. And she's like, this is running out every day. And it turns out you left the Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah, well, you know, then, okay. yeah. Sorry. Right here, sir. My, my question is like, somehow related to the questions said before, but from a different perspective. Um, what are the skills required for young journalists who are going to join the market? Uh, is, like, what, what do you recommend for, for, for young journalists to learn in order to meet the impact of the applications? Like, do you recommend them like, to learn coding or to learn some skills related to this new technology? No, I, I usually don't actually. What I say you need is, the, the first thing you need is exactly what you needed before. You need to know how to edit a story or write a story. Um, you need to know how to reach an audience and think about why you're assigning this story or why you're writing it a particular way, why you write it this way for Pop Sci and this way for Pop Mechanics or this way for the Journal and this way for the Times. Uh, you need to know how to report because there's fewer and fewer people doing that. Um, you need to know how to report fast because you're going to have less time to do it. I do think it is about those fundamental skills, and I get really nervous every time I read a story about a journalism school who's making kids learn, uh, you know, X code, um, because that's coming at the expense of some other class, and maybe there's some room to do both, but it shouldn't be coming at the expense of your copy editing class. It just shouldn't. You should still know how to make this nice, because at the end of the day, particularly in these kinds of what are essentially premium products, as opposed to we read blogs and we accept, you know, copy editing errors. This, if we want people to pay for it, can't be sloppy. It has to be well reported. It has to be well written. It has to be copy edited. Um, what I would say on that front is awareness, is know the space, you know, the kind of critical um, reading questions I put up earlier. And just, you know, if you, re if you follow any of the kind of media newsletters, Ed 2010, Media Bistro, um, MPA's Daily Newsletter, um, uh, you know, whatever the other ones are, even Gawker, um, just, you, you know, there's stories every day about what's happening in the space. Who came out with a new app? Who's trying this? Um, who's, you know, who's had some success? Um, what are the platforms that are out there? Knowing about that is, is really good because you're going to go into these places. We were talking about this earlier. You're going to go out and look for a job and you're going to be interviewing with somebody who's either having to think about this or is about to have to think about it. Um, they probably don't want to have to think about it because they already have a job um, and they don't probably know a lot about it. So if you come in as the person who can help them figure that out or just sound like you can, um, it's going to make you more valuable. You know, that's the person. I want to hire somebody. And if I'm hiring somebody now, I want, first of all, I want a great editor or writer, whatever the job is. Um, but I want somebody who's excited about this world and who knows about it, who can help me, the old guy, figure it out as I'm sort of moving forward. So that's what I would say is just really dive in. And even if you don't have an iPad, you know, you don't necessarily need one. Just be aware, be able to have the conversation with people about what's happening and what some of these questions are, all the things we're talking about tonight. Go ahead, you please. Right now you don't, because nobody really has that. The way we're going to solve that pretty simply is just that when you go to share, well, there'll be two ways to do it. If you're sharing to somebody who has this same app and they can then get this article and render it in the same kind of design form um, that you can, it'll know that and you can spit it off to them that way. It'll show up in their app as an article and it'll render this way for the rest of the world, because you, you need to be able to share out of that little closed world. Um, the, the system will automatically generate a little web link for every story. And what you'll actually be sharing is a, is a web page that has a very simplified version of that story. So it doesn't have, you know, all of these sort of, um, you know, big beautiful images on it like this has. Um, maybe it'll just have one image, but it'll have all the text there. So you can at least say, hey, you should read this article. And then we'll put a little ad on that, or on that web page that says, if you want to see the full thing, go buy our iPad app or whatever. But that's the way you'll do it. It's, it's just everything has to live out on the web. It has to have a sort of web presence and be out in that cloud world um, to be able to be on Facebook and be tweeted and be shared. Mm -hmm. Julie. Sorry, I have to ask this. <laughs> 
you mentioned a while ago, this is more personal thing. You said that if you didn't have to have the iPad, you wouldn't want to create a I. I just literally haven't, I mean, and this is terrible for me to say because I make my living on this thing now, but um, being that honest here with you guys tonight, um, I haven't figured out yet what I do with it. You know what I mean? I bring it home. I mean, it lives in my, I carry it constantly because I'm always showing it off to people. It's always in my bag. Um, I bring it home and it sits in my bag all weekend long. And sometimes I'll feel guilty about that. So I'll pull it out and I'll start looking for apps. And there are some cool apps. I mean, there's some really interesting stuff out there. There's like a great sort of observatory one where you can paint it at the, or point it at the sky and it shows right. you what constellation, yeah. like that's awesome, but not that helpful in, in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, Netflix is, is pretty cool on it. Like you can have a Netflix account and you can stream things, but I don't Facebook. Really, I don't, I'm not even on Facebook. Um, so I don't do that. My wife likes to do that with it. I just, I haven't figured out what the use case is for me. I'm also the kind of guy who, uh, both my wife and I have these little Mac laptops now, and this is what sits on our lap when we're on the couch. If I didn't have this, if I only had a desktop computer that sat in the office, I'd probably use this a lot more. I think typing on this is a pain in the butt, so I don't, you know, again, if I'm just even typing in a URL to go to a web mm -hmm. address, I grab this thing first, because on here I'm doing this, and I feel like an old man because I can't do it quickly, and um, so yeah, that's why I probably, probably wouldn't have one. <laughs> Based on my uh, 10 long days of experience on the iPad, I would say that I find it useful really for only one thing, and that is if I'm at a place where I would normally pick up a, a, a paper magazine away from the computer, or I'm, you know, say on the couch or on the train or whatever, it's quite useful mm -hmm. as a, it, it, it basically, for me, and I think for a lot of other people too, it serves a very similar function as a paper magazine. You know, it's just not comfortable to read a paper magazine. Just w when you're reading a magazine, you're sort of in more relaxation mode, and you don't want to be sitting like that. Uh, so, just you know, we do this all the time. We're just generalizing based on our personal experience. But yeah. to me, the future of the iPad or, or tablets in general is very closely tied to sort of casual reading away from the desk. Away from the desk. Mm -hmm. I don't, I totally agree with you that it's awful for, oh, there's Corey Vince story. Uh, I, it's it's yeah. awful to uh, type on this. It's mm -hmm. quite uncomfortable to type on this. Now, I don't know if other people have found that. There's not a lot of iPad users here, but. Oh yeah, and then they say, what you should do is get one of those great uh, Bluetooth um, Apple keyboards. And then, of course, what you have is a, is a clunky Mac Air, you know, right. so. Um, yeah, they're not, they're not, they don't. The driver for the iPad very clearly is not the user experience. It's a way of allowing big publishing companies to recapture their subscription model and for advertisers to recapture an advertising space. And, you know, as, someone who, as someone who wants to be paid for what I, I do, that's a beautiful thing. Let's but hope, except there's no yeah, exactly, this. exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just to kind of comment on that, if I would, one of the reasons I was asking about utility is right now the iPad is the thing to buy. As you said earlier, it's seven to eight hundred dollars. If I'm not using it for anything else, and then I have to buy additional, like I have to spend additional money on magazines, why would I do that? That doesn't really make any sense for me to spend that much money. On something that's just going to require me to spend more money in the future. Like, it's yeah. going to be that, like, that price point has to come way down before, like, I would be willing to do that. And I'm a journalism major. Like, this is the thing that's supposed to kind of save, like, my job as a user. But at the same time, it, it's really difficult to see the utility of spending one additional money on. Yeah, I mean, the people I've talked to who are sort of most happy with it, and I, a lot of people, most people I talk to have one and love it. Um, mm -hmm. They like it because it does replace this, and they're using it for that kind of productivity stuff. They're emailing with it all the time. They're doing basic web stuff. Um, and that's what they really like about it. I mean, I agree. As a reading are device. They writing, are they writing long? Are they writing memos? Or? No, they're writing emails. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's just not, it doesn't have good utility for that. There's, it's interesting, somebody just pointed me to, um, to this app, which is called uh, IA Writer, and it's supposed to be a, um, like a super simple, they have this like focus mode where everything else goes away, there's only one font, 
um, and it's supposed to be designed for kind of having this nice immersive writing environment on, uh, on the iPad. I don't know whether or not it works because I haven't used it yet, but if anybody wants to write, please check it out. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I think the hope from an individual standpoint is that, I mean, with blogging, there have been a number of people, um, science writers and whatever, who've been quite successful at building themselves as a brand mm -hmm. in the blogging space. But of course, well, that may be very good for your ego and it may feed in sideways to your ability to get a book contract or your ability to freelance for the New York Times or something that's actually income producing. Your, the blog itself doesn't really generate you any money. Right. And I think there's some hope, however fantastical that hope may be, that transferring that blog into an app mm -hmm. kind of creates a more of a monetizing, that's the right word, monetizing opportunity for the blogger yeah. in that, you know, somehow in, in, when Dorothy comes back to Oz, this will all work and, and uh, we'll get checks again. You know, right. so. I, you know, at least initially there might, until apps are totally ubiquitous, it might be true because, I mean, we know people buy these devices and then you want apps for it. Like, so people go out and they do spend a lot of money and iPad users spend even more money than iPhone users do on apps. Um, and we, you know, like at PopSci, we, we built an app that, all it does is bring through headlines and stories from the web. It's, it's really no harder than just going to the website to read, but people like getting it that way. They like this kind of app form of getting things. Um, so, I mean, if we can find the right balance of it being cool to present that way, maybe. Maybe we'll get people to pay. Also, this whole notion of like 99 cents, you know, buck 99. 99 cents is like free now. People are like, oh, 99 cents, all right, fine, 99 cents. It takes a long time to make a lot of money that way, but it's better than free. What do you want to read on an iPad? Um, I've read books on it, and I do like it for that. Um, I took it on my honeymoon, and I read a couple of books on it, and I thought it was, I thought it was good for that. Um, I do really like reading this way, scrolling, and pages sort of bo bother me on it. Um, and I, I like the New Yorker app, which is on Adobe, so mm -hmm. I shouldn't like it because it's a competitor. But um, if that had a subscription and wasn't five bucks a week, I would probably subscribe that. Because again, I guess what I'm saying is I like long form reading on it. Um, mm. I think it's good at that. And for that same reason that I can carry it in my, in my pocket and I don't, you know, I'm not carrying my issue, which I usually am in my bag, an issue of Wired, an issue of The New Yorker, mm -hmm. an issue of PopSci, an issue of Esquire and GQ, which are that thick. And, um, That's exactly what it's good for, for me. <coughs> I, I, I've heard several people for the paper. We have a, a, a wrap-up question, Dan. You have to, here, here. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, talking about the sort of high-level data trends that we've seen, apparently people do like watching video on, on this, both through things like Netflix or like one of the more popular apps is 60 Minutes app, um, hmm. which people apparently love. It kind of delves into the catalog of the back catalog of 60 Minutes. Um, but some of the top apps on here are video apps. And then also hmm. testing we've done in advertising. A lot of the early magazine ads were like a print magazine ad with their TV commercial stuck in the middle of it, just, just horrible from a creativity standpoint and frankly offensive as a consumer that they think that's what I want. But it turned out that everybody was clicking and watching the 30 second spots. Um, so I think at least now, again, and, and this may change as the behavior changes, I think if there's a play button on this, people will hit it. And I think they like watching video on it. I think they like the, it's that nice combination of it's still a pretty big screen, but it is kind of close and intimate. You know, it's not as far away as this screen is. Um, and it's not as tiny as my iPhone screen. So I think it's a great platform for that. Um, and I think it would be awesome if you made a video that people had to keep doing this to watch. <laughs> I guess, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, what, what I've gotten out of listening here tonight is, is just what an extraordinarily interesting opportunity this presents in so many ways. And, and of course, none of us have any idea <laughs> right. what this will be doing even next week or whenever, uh, I don't know, the next version of this comes out with some different technological capacity. 
But I really appreciate how you've given us um, the benefit of your expertise and your really quite remarkable perspective on this landscape. And it's really, I just learned a lot this evening, and I really thank you for that. Good. Thanks for having me.